Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Church of the Oranges. For those of you who's here for, who's here for the first time, just want to extend a very warm welcome here to you, and I hope that you are not here just for the last time, but that you come back again to visit with us. We're just going to get started this evening with some songs of praise and worship, and so I invite you to just join in with me. These songs, I'm sure we all know. So, the song says, Kumbaya, my Lord, which means come by here, my Lord.
Amen. Good evening, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Come on, I know it's a Juneteenth celebration, but we got to worship tonight, amen. We have something to celebrate. If that's the best you can do, we in trouble. We're talking about the God of our weary years, the God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far along the way. We are here to celebrate not just what God has done, but what God is doing and has yet to do. Amen. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads, close our eyes as we pray together. All wise God, our Father, we are gathered here tonight, dear God, to celebrate what we call Juneteenth. That day in 1965 when slaves in Texas learned of their freedom more than two years after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, we celebrate, dear God, the liberation of all slaves tonight as well as our continued fight for true freedom. Lord, we are grateful for your liberating power. We are grateful, dear God, for the successes we have had on this journey. But we come now asking for your continued blessings as we continue this fight for our freedom. While slavery has been outlawed, it still exists in certain areas in our society, dear God, and we need your power to right that wrong. Thank you, Lord, that black prison populations have dropped over the last several years, but Lord, we still see a criminal justice system that incarcerates black Americans more than any other part of the population. We still see, even in this great liberal state, too great of a disparity between black and white prison populations. And we know, Heavenly Father, that prison is the new slavery. So Lord, as we have gathered with the powerful and the powerless, we call on your name to use each of us to right these wrongs. Let your justice reign not just in our hearts, but in our communities, in our courts, and in our prisons. We call on you to use us, dear God, to inspire and empower us, to create the change necessary to finally level the playing field so that these families that have been devastated by the mass incarceration movement may be restored. We know you can, dear God. We trust you will. And we ask that you start right here, right now, with these, your people, who have come together to celebrate Juneteenth because we care and are committed to justice. Bless this gathering. Bless each of us that are here, especially these speakers, that tonight we might leave this place with a renewed sense of purpose, a stronger commitment to change, and a greater unity among all people, that together we might do your will. This is your, our prayer, our Heavenly Father. Amen. seated in the presence of God. This time, I'm looking to see if Reverend Hooper's here for our scripture reading. Uh, if he's not, we just want to say to each and every one of you, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Church of the Oranges. Touch your neighbor right now. Tell him, I'm glad you're here. Tell him, tell him right now, I'm glad you're here. And here's what I want you to say to somebody. To see the change, you must be the change. Come on, say that to somebody right now. To see the change, you must be the change. All of us are links in the chain, let down from God out of heaven to save the world. We have a corporate responsibility to all do our part. Remember, the chain is as strong as its weakest link. I'm determined I'm going to be a strong link. Come on, somebody ought to say, I'm a strong link. I'm just so excited this evening that you've taken the time out of your busy schedule. Some of you left work early. Some of you didn't go to work. Just so you can come and celebrate this evening with us. We are thrilled that you took the time to come here for this momentum, momentous occasion. We know that Juneteenth is really... Uh, a, a unique celebration 
Uh, it really is about freedom. Everybody say freedom. And the tragedy about it is that people were free but didn't know they were free. And if you're free and you don't know you're free, you're still incarcerated. You're still enslaved. You're still free. But I, uh, not free. But I want to encourage everybody today to understand that Juneteenth is a building block for our history. Don't let's not forget the journey of our forefathers. Let's not forget those who paved the way. Let's not forget those who sacrificed. Let's not forget those who served, those who marched, those who prayed, those who went above and beyond the call of duty so that every one of us may have the freedoms that we have today. Somebody ought to bless God for right now for all that they endured for us. And I tell people, if you don't vote, you desecrate their memory. If you don't vote, you're part of the problem, not a part of the solution. And I know that everybody who's taking the time to come here today, you vote. We, we, we vote. Let me take a moment to say a special word of welcome to all of the members of the clergy who are here, and I want to acknowledge them today, all of the members of the clergy. Rabbi, if you all could please stand. We just want to say thank you for coming. Y'all don't mind. Please stand up so we can see who you are, so we can just say thank you for coming. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you for all that you do. Uh, I'm going to get out the way, and um, uh, before I do, I think it would be inappropriate for us to have a celebration like this and not sing the Black National Anthem. That would be sacrilege. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me today. And there's no controversy on this one. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. The Black National Anthem. I'm going to ask our video team if they could put it on the screen. If not, we have given you a sheet with the words just so you can have the actual physical copy in your hands. Thank you so much. We have the words here even for our praise team. Thank you.
put your hands together and bless God, everybody. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to introduce you quickly to my mayor. Uh, and I, I will declare he's the best mayor in the state of New Jersey. Not just because he's the mayor of arms, but because it's the fact. It's just the truth. And you can take it to the bank. Put your hands together and welcome our mayor. And while he's coming, I'm going to ask all members of our city council to please stand. All the mayors of city council, all the members of city council are here. Please stand just so we can see who you are. God bless you. Thank you, Reverend, and good evening. I bring you greetings from the city of Orange Township on this Juneteenth day. What a great day it is. Thank you, Reverend, and to this house of worship for opening your doors to such a time as this where this statement is necessary. I would like to thank and acknowledge some of our elected officials who are in the room. Uh, a person near and dear to my heart because he serves on the Orange Board of Education. Please uh, give a hand to uh, Brother Derek Henry, who's on our Board of Education, City of Orange Township. Of course, our council person, Donna Williams, is here up front. From Maplewood, I saw Mayor DeLuca. Where is he? Thank you, sir. All the way from the township of Irvington, Charnette Frederick, Councilwoman, thank you for representing the city of Irvington. Uh, my mother, my mentor, the person who still whips out the strap when necessary, Councilwoman Mildred Crump, City of Newark. Thank you, Council President. In the assembly, we have no better fighter in the city of Orange Township than Assemblywoman Brittany Timberlake. And of course, we have uh, words of greeting from a uh, Lieutenant uh, Governor Sheila Oliver, who's always fighting for us. We thank her for her well wishes. Same with uh, Assemblyman Tom Gibbon, who couldn't be here yet, but he sends his well wishes as well. And certainly, uh, you've seen the entry of the Chief Executive Officer of the State of New Jersey, my friend, Governor Phil Murphy. This promises to be a great presentation that will leave us fulfilled, but hopefully it leaves us energized with a mission to go out and spread the word, because this celebration today is about a word that was not spread um, some over 200 years ago. It got there too late, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm upset because even now with the internet, even now with instant information, we are not getting the message whether it be from assault on our voting rights. Some of us don't know that there is Supreme Court decisions right now that is assaulting our voting rights. <laughs> Equal pay for women. It took 202 years to get the word out, but still it isn't out that women work hard every day. Women head families. They do the man's job. They should get equal pay for that. I don't know how long you've not gotten the message, but there's an assault on immigrants in America. Us being left out of the economy, us being left out of technology, us being left out of education, we're not getting the message, but we need to drive it home that we need to be on the front lines on all of those issues if we are going to be a productive people and if we're going to get the word out. So let Juneteenth mean something here today. It means that we're going to not only get the word out, we're going to get the work out and stand behind all of our leaders to make sure that the job gets done, that our communities get advanced, and that we take advantage of each and every opportunity that President Lincoln signed into law, that we're supposed to be a part of the economy, the country, the education, and all the bounty that America has to offer. <laughs> Reverend, thank you very much. Enjoy the show. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. 
It is so great to see everyone here. I'll get right down to what I'm supposed to do. Um, it is an honor for me to present a great man. Uh, I do not take for granted that we have our governor, Phil Murphy, as the governor of the state of New Jersey. Mother, Mother Mildred, Mother Mildred, we cannot take for granted. Virginia has a governor that dresses up in KKK outfits. We have a governor that is fighting for our people every single day that he wakes up. Every day. And I thank God, not too far ago, we had Chris Christie as our governor. And today we have a governor, today we have a governor who fights every day, who understands and sees our issues from the lens of a former board member of the NAACP. We are blessed to have Governor Phil Murphy. I can go on and on. Some people may say, well, Green, you, you, Reverend, you work for him. I do. And I'm proud of it. Yes, sir. And I'm proud of it. Because I understand his ethos, and I understand the attacks that he comes under because of the stands that he, that he takes, fighting for us every single day. I, I will stop there, because I could go on and on Assembly woman about how great this man is, and I, because I have been, and let me just say this. The reason why I say this because, and my wife is here, because of the fact that I'm in meetings. I am in those meetings, and when, when he is making decisions, when he had to make a decision on whether to sign or veto the independent prosecutor bill to ensure transparency and fairness in our criminal justice system. And I was in the room when he said, I am going to sign the bill. I am going to sign the bill. So ladies and gentlemen, our governor, you know who he is, you know his name. The man that God has chosen to lead this state at this time, our governor, Phil Murphy. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I just said to the good Reverend Derek Green, I'm not sure what I can say that's going to live up to that, but thank you uh, nonetheless. The most important thing that I'm going to say is the first thing, which is I want to give glory and honor to God. Yes, Every, <laughs> everything else is downhill. Uh, by the way, thank God I've got the lyrics to lift every voice and sing, because as Derek said, I was a national board member a former national board member of the NAACP, and I would constantly butcher the lyrics. And so I'm honored that I'm now, as a prompt, I've got them up here with me. One of the great anthems in our country. Would you all agree? <laughs> to my friend and early supporter, Dr. Errol Stoddard, and First Lady, uh, Miss Vernay, who stepped out, it looks like. Uh, there she is, she's in the back. No, that's okay. Um, thank you so much for your friendship, for your support. I've had the honor of worshiping here. We've had the honor of having you in our home. And it's so great to be back. To the elders, deacons, deaconesses, officers, members, and friends of the Church of the Oranges, it is good to be back. And I have to apologize up front. And if I tell you what my choices are this evening, you'll appreciate that I'm doing what I'm doing because I have to as opposed to uh, what I would like to do, which is to stay here and continue to be with you all night long. I have to leave after I speak because I have to go to ask the governor and field all these incoming questions. People have their hair on fire about one thing or another. Uh, we, we now twice a month give them that chance and it's tonight uh, one of those moments. So forgive me in advance. To the many faith leaders, I see Rabbi Abe, I see Reverend Joe, I see so many other leaders of faith here from all faiths who are present from other congregations and other faiths. God bless you all. 
to all of the elected officials. Mayor Warren, where are you, Dwayne? Thank you, man, for um, being our host mayor tonight. Madam President, uh, if only uh, in our country, Mildred, uh, God bless you. Brittany, uh, Councilman Williams, Mayor Vic, I lost you. You're back there somewhere, second time today with you. Other, other elected officials and members of council from a number of the communities here in Essex County. It is an honor to be with you. Uh, and again, Mayor, Mayor Dwayne Warren, thank you for being our host mayor for this evening. And I, um, and again, I want to thank Reverend Green uh, for his partnership. He said, I work for him. And I, I view it the other way. I actually feel like I work for Derek. So I, I do what Derek tells me to do. Um, and again, back to, to Dr. Errol Stoddard. I remember our first meeting in Summit, uh, interestingly. And you've remained an advisor to me. And I thank you for your leadership. And again, to all the faith leaders who are here, thank you for your continued counsel and guidance. I'm honored to, to be on the roster with Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams, which is a real treat. So bless you. And my dear friend Larry Ham, otherwise known as Imani's dad. And if you didn't, uh, uh, Larry gave a, a, a eulogy uh, recently, and it was one of the eulogies of the ages. So Larry, I only hope that every time I get up and speak that I can, I can uh, do a fraction of the job you did. Um, I thank you both for being part of the celebratory service, and I'm honored uh, to have my name uh, alongside you. I, I don't, D Dr. Boroff, are you here somewhere? Dr. Boroff, in from representing Seton Hall, I know is gonna speak later, so bless you. Reverend Joe has got, a, uh, has got, got you in close stewardship behind, beside you there, so um, thank you all. On this day, 154 years ago, Union General Gordon Granger, landing with troops in Galveston, Texas, spread the word that all enslaved blacks were at last free. Think about that for a moment. This on June 19, 1865. President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on New Year's Day, 1863. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Imagine living in a time and in a nation where it would take nearly two and a half years for word of your freedom from slavery to reach you. Imagine the thought of hearing those words knowing that you had lost 900 days in which you could have been free of forced labor. Imagine hearing those words a full two months after the end of the war, which was fought because some people wanted to keep you in chains, tied literally and figuratively to backbreaking work, and viewed, by the way, at the same time, and I don't need to tell you all this, as only three-fifths of a person. And imagine thinking of those who had died toiling in the hot fields or at the hands of unimaginable abuse by overseers and plantation owners in those days between the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and Juneteenth, never knowing that they were of right free men and free women. Imagine that. In our celebration, let us keep them in our hearts, our deepest prayers, and in our minds. Juneteenth celebrates the end of the physical manifestations that held African Americans in bondage, and for that we must celebrate. This was a nation conceived in liberty, yet which held this original sin for far too long. It is very fitting that we celebrate Juneteenth 2019, as it is also the 400-year anniversary of the arrival of Africans in America. However, even in this Juneteenth celebration today, we cannot ignore and we cannot deny the invisible chains that have kept too many of our African American communities from rising, even in this day and even in New Jersey. Yes, slavery is over legally, but the moral conflict of we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal versus the reality that equality has been for some communities a consistent struggle. We cannot deny that that lingers today. 
Yes, slavery is over, but the chains of systemic racism, those easy to spot in the words and actions of the bigoted and ignorant, and those more hidden, which resist our efforts to yank them up from their roots, have taken its place. Systemic racism is found in educational funding, where too often your zip code determines the quality of your child's education. It is found in a criminal justice system with the nation's worst racial disparity between blacks and whites, in which the misnamed awful war on drugs emptied out neighborhoods for petty possession crimes while an opioid epidemic ravaged the streets, and in which too many guns than we wish to count pierced the quiet. Amen. Dr. Stoddart's brother was one of the victims. Bless his memory and soul. That is the main reason why I wanted to legalize small amounts of marijuana for adult personal use. If that bill had passed, and this is important to know because it's the status quo that's unacceptable as opposed to something per allowing perfect to be the enemy of the good. If that bill had passed, we would have broken a cycle that sees more than 600 people a week, overwhelmingly persons of color, arrested for possession and their futures short-circuited. For those who claim I'm looking at revenue instead of at justice, they need to talk to the woman who came to me during the campaign and said, and I quote her, my son served time for marijuana possession. He can't get a job because this is on his record. Yet no one in financial services went to jail for causing millions of people to lose their homes. And there are the chains of economic racism, where communities have been cut off from good jobs, where the spoils flow only to a select few rather than to the broader community, and where unequal wages have prevented families from lifting themselves from poverty and into the middle class. This systemic racism has reached African-American businesses who, when we took office, complained that they were not afforded opportunities to do business with the state. There are the chains of racial disparities in health care, including African-American maternal and infant health. Something that my wife, by the way, the First Lady sends her very best wishes. My wife is, is, is captured as, as one of her most important initiatives that she's working on with many of the folks here tonight. A new black mother in New Jersey is five times more likely to die from a complication of pregnancy than a white mother. A black baby is over three times more likely than a white baby to never celebrate her or his first birthday. In, two th in 2019, in New Jersey, this is completely and utterly unacceptable. There are the chains, there are the chains from foreclosures that destabilize communities and families and drag down property values. A house for many people of color is the economic catalyst that starts businesses or pays for an education. I was in Atlantic County earlier today, county number one per capita in the United States of America of foreclosed homes, community number one for foreclosed homes per capita in America is Atlantic City. These chains are the legacy of slavery which we continue to live with today. And unless we work together to break these chains, we cannot say with straight faces that we are, in fact, free. So today, on June 19th, on June 19th, I feel like always saying June 19th, 2019. On, June, on, on Juneteenth, 2019, I am proud that in New Jersey, we are breaking these chains. We are not heroes. I know I'm not a hero. And the road is long. But together, over the past nearly year and a half, we have taken hammer blow after hammer blow to those chains. As governor, I have established a culture where racial disparities in wealth, income, health, criminal justice, housing, and wherever they lurk will not be accepted. But it takes a certain, but it takes a certain focus. We need to stop talking about change and be about change. It takes policy changes to break the back of systemic racism. Yes, 
And for the record, we are working hard to break the back of systemic racism, especially with Donald Trump as our president. We have no choice. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no choice. We worked hard to pass a law that in just 11 days, by the way, will see our minimum wage tick up to $10 an hour, the first step on its journey ultimately to $15 an hour. We have given everyone who works the guarantee of a paid sick day, and we have given more workers than ever access to paid family leave when they need more time. We have made tough choices to better fund our public schools, increase our investment in pre-K, and start a historic program allowing residents to attend community college and get their associate's degree completely tuition free. I know Brittany is an ally on this, but for some reason, the legislative budget that was put through the committees on Monday have cut that program dramatically. I think that might be one of the stupidest steps we could take as a state. We are transforming people's lives. And by the way, this just in, and you all know this probably, but the folks in community colleges are not just 18-year-olds. They're 18, 28, 38, 48, 58, 68. They're of all, all shapes and sizes, all ethnicities, all races. Uh, and we're making a huge difference in their lives, and they will in turn make a huge difference in our society and in our economy. Pre-K is critical. We know that. We know children who benefit from pre-K go on to return our investment in them many times over. I want to see a kid from Orange get a quality education free of charge from pre-K through college and stay here to finish their college and work here and raise their families right here in New Jersey. That's good for them and it's good for all of New Jersey. Mildred, I'm preaching now. We are investing in, it's getting warm, but get in the car out of first gear here. Please bear with me. I, God only knows what Ask the Governor is gonna be like when I get there. We are investing in reentry programs to ensure that our returning citizens have access to the programs they need to get a second chance, including drug treatment, job training, and affordable housing. Yesterday, by the way, not just for folks in, in a reentry program, yesterday for the first time in the history of the state, we gave Narcan away free of charge up and down the state in 174 locations. I am positive we will have saved lives. I believe in second chances. I get a lot of heat for this, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stand strong. Folks deserve a second chance, and I will be their governor. I will be their governor. I will be their governor. Our criminal justice system has a checkered past in its relationship with black and brown communities. Our society does not reach its full potential when people cannot participate equally, period. We need those returning to society to be able to be productive members of society. It doesn't benefit anyone, obviously not them first and foremost, but it doesn't benefit anyone when someone serves a two-year sentence, but it turns out in reality it's a life sentence. That is why, by the way, one of the first executive orders I signed when I took office reconstituted New Jersey's long dormant in the last administration, Criminal Sentencing and Disposition Commission to comprehensively review our criminal sentencing laws so we can move ever closer to that ideal of equal justice under the law. And it is why I asked my friend, our friend, Giles Shipp, a leader in the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, to serve on this commission. It's why I established a juvenile justice task force to give policy recommendations on continued reform of our juvenile justice system. It is why I signed a law requiring that the Attorney General's office, and Derek alluded to this, investigate law enforcement related deaths, which is another state, and Brittany was a champion of that, bless you, which is another step in rebuilding the trust between the police on the one hand and the communities they serve on the other. We are also fixing our broken mass transit system. We will fix NJ Transit if it kills me, which it might, by the way. It is, we did not, uh, we did not bat a thousand today, just FYI, in case you're on the rails. NJ Transit is the lifeline for countless residents to get to work, 
or to school or simply the store, and I'm guilty of this more than anybody, we spend a disproportion of our time talking about the rail side of NJ Transit, because that's where a lot of the, the, the breakage was, but the bus system is probably the most important bus system in America. So all of these, when we take them together, are strong blows for freedom. But there is still much more to do, and we must find our strength and our faith to accomplish them. After slavery, many African Americans left the South and came to the North, many to New Jersey, in search of freedom, in the name of that great phrase and book, in search of the warmth of other suns. Today, we have people not just from elsewhere in America, but from around the world, many in this sanctuary, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Nigeria, Barbados, Ghana, Mexico, Latin America, all over this world who come here. This is the greatest nation on earth because of who and what we are made of. I just wish we had a president who understood that. Yeah. Reverend and Mayor, I'm gonna probably need the two of you at a minimum, probably some other folks as well. Wouldn't it be nice to invite the president into this sanctuary, ask him to stand here and allow one of us to say, Mr. President, look around you. This is the United States of America right here. This is America. This is America. I want that one chance, Reverend. I want that one chance. Make sure the mayor says it's okay. Even with the progress we have made, the game is still tilted in favor of the well-off and the well-connected. We cannot find our freedom unless we have full equality, and not just about social equality, but as well about economic equality. But if there is one thing I have learned, it is that justice is a fight worth fighting for. This is one reason why I have been fighting so hard and will continue to do so for tax fairness and to require the wealthiest residents the 19,000 New Jerseyans out of 9 million, making over $1 million a year to pay a little more in income tax so we could take the proceeds and invest in the other 9 million New Jerseyans who could benefit from everything from more property tax relief, renter's relief, more affordable housing, better schools, better health care. It's a no-brainer. And by the way, I don't begrudge the success of those folks. It's the American dream. Part of our system is unlimited upside. But the price we pay for the American dream cannot be, on the un unlimited upside of it, cannot be unlimited downside for our brothers and sisters having trouble realizing their dreams. So this is not about begrudging success. This is about leveling the playing field. Come on in and help us. And by the way, guess what? When you invest in great schools and health care and transportation and property tax relief, not only the folks you invest in do well, everybody does well, including the very wealthiest among us. It's why I've been fighting, you may have noticed, you may have noticed that it's why I'm fighting so hard to change the way that we hand out millions in special tax breaks to businesses so we could see more of that money invested in rebuilding entire communities and creating new housing and new jobs for the countless residents who stayed, fought, and stayed in these communities through dark and challenging times, rather than just putting it into building shiny new towers that many in the community will never ever see the inside of. That's not right. That's not fair. This is why, under our administration, cities like Orange and East Orange and Newark and Irvington, Camden and Atlantic City and Patterson and Trenton, among others, have a governor who is a partner in progress, not a governor like before who will stand on the necks of our communities. It is why I've been fighting, as I mentioned, for the legalization of adult use marijuana and the expungement of thousands of drug-related arrests so we can finally end the warehousing of predominantly young black men in our jails for minor offenses. Come on. And I'm not doing this alone, and I'm no hero, believe me. I have been fighting these fights alongside many in this room. We have yet to achieve our victory, but I know that if we do not lose our faith, we will win. And I know we will not lose our faith, Reverend. These fights are ours to win. They are how we can, in the words of Lift Every Voice and Sing, move New Jersey, quote, out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our star is cast.
When black Americans were escaping the vicious and inhumane institution of slavery, many headed to New York and Canada and came through New Jersey along the way. New Jersey had its own plantations, for sure, but we still had Harriet Tubman shepherding the newly free through the Underground Railroad. I'm going off script here for a second. Did you see the pathetic testimony about Harriet Tubman's likeness on the face of the $20 bill? Larry, did you see that? By Mnuchin? That was pathetic. And it came out, it turns out, at the end of the Obama administration, they had the bill ready to go. And this guy's claiming, for security reasons, they can't have it ready until 2028. You gotta be kidding me. Total, total. Don't, I don't wanna get hit for lightning by, for agreeing with you in a sanctuary. <laughs> I completely agree with you. We all know this. Few things come easy. Ask those slaves from Texas who waited 900 days to taste the freedom that had been denied them and whose freedom we celebrate today. If we remain true to ourselves and to our purpose, we will prevail. We will prevail with a New Jersey that is stronger than before, fairer than ever, and proof to every state that years of systemic racism can be overcome. But we must do it together. I cannot do it alone more than any one person in this sanctuary can do it alone. Let this be our new charge. Let us use our power and the power of our faith to do this. And if we do, I know that when we come back here to celebrate Juneteenth in the future, we will not only be able to celebrate the freedom of those who lived more than a century ago, but those who live in our today and in our tomorrow. May God bless you all. Thank you so much for having me. May God bless the great state of New Jersey and the United States of America. Come on, bless God right now, everybody, one more time. And I just want to say to my governor, to our governor, I, I told the state's attorney when he was here back a few months ago, uh, the story of my brother who was killed over marijuana. And I told the governor just now, I will help you fight that fight. Whether you give me a chance to talk for two minutes, two days, two weeks, two months, or two years. My brother was shot and killed by some young men in North Philadelphia and they said we came to rob him because we thought he was selling weed and we came to rob him. That was their testimony in court. And I can't help but think, if marijuana was legal back then, maybe, just maybe, my brother would still be alive today. And that is the story of so many. I will help you fight that fight. God bless you, God bless you. Come on everybody, let's celebrate the governor of our great state. Governor Murphy, amen and amen. What an inspiration, what a motivation, and I pray God that none of us will remain in our seats, in our positions of comfort, but that we'll rise up to the call, that we will face the challenge and do our part. Everybody has a part to play. And I'm asking you, I'm challenging you by God's grace, let's rise up and do our parts. When one finger stands alone, it's just a finger. But bless God, when five fingers uh, ball up together, they form a fist and can strike a mighty blow. Let's form that fist and, and strike a mighty blow for the welfare of our community. God bless you. There's a young lady here, I understand, is a great dynamic musician. And uh, are, you, are you ready to sing for us, honey? Are you, are you ready to sing? Can she, can, she, can she come and just bless our hearts? Come on up and bless our hearts, dear. Come on up and bless our hearts. Good evening once again. We are honored to have um, award-winning musician, evangelist, pastor, great woman of God, Dr. Fondrea Lewis in the house. 
And we just ask her to bless our soul. People know her. And I just say she has the anointing of God on her. And, and you will see what I'm saying in a minute. Doctor, Rodriguez. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Praise the Lord. Since we're in the house of the Lord, why don't we give God praise on tonight? Amen. If you know that he's able, clap your hands and give him glory. <laughs> glory to God. We honor the Lord. I would like to say thank you to the praise team for accompanying me on tonight. But on this auspicious occasion, we give honor to God, to the angel of this house, Pastor Stoddard. We thank God for you welcoming me to your house and to our Reverend uh, Derek Green and to our governor. Let's thank God for him, that he is a God-fearing man. Amen. To all of our city officials and dignitaries from every city and every state, and to mine especially from the great city of Newark, our council president, Mildred Crump, is here, and we thank God for her on tonight. Our clergy affairs uh, president, Reverend Louise Roundtree, and to all of those, amen, to all of you who I don't know your names, but we honor the Lord and we thank God tonight because we are here for such an amazing occasion, the freedom of African Americans. And so that plight from beginning to end, there had to be, there had to be, um, songs that were sung in order to keep our hearts encouraged and so we know that there are songs from the past and there are songs from today but one thing I know that whatever our trouble is whatever our challenges are that God is able to bring us through all of them so we just want to share that on tonight not, not the track yet I just want you to follow me Oh, 
Jesus.
that's the story of our people. Don't give up on God, because he won't give up on you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Fundrea, and the praise team, and the musicians. Let me introduce our next speaker. First, I just want to give honor to God again and to this great pastor. This great pastor. Oh, y'all can do better than that. This great pastor. Dr. Errol Stoddard. Great man of God. Great community leader. Thank you so much. Because this is just Wednesday night prayer meeting for you. Thank you so much. And to the first lady of this church. To the first lady of this church. Who has known me since I was seven years old. And I'm a little older than seven now. Let me introduce our next speaker. And before I do that, I, do, I, I, must, um, I must recognize my son, who is in the audience. My son, please stand, Derek Andrew David Green, who is, who is a 2019 graduate of Morehouse College. So he is debt free. Look at God. But Dr. Antoinette, Dr. Antoinette, I told him his great-grandfather, Frank Green, my grandfather, fought in World War I for democracy and freedom in Germany, but couldn't wear his uniform in the United States of America. And his great-great-grandson has a college degree from Morehouse College. God is faithful. I said, God is faithful. Our next speaker, Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams, was graduated from Seton Hall with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology. She earned a Master's of Public Administration, uh, MPA from the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Reverend Dr. Ellis Williams earned her doctorate in public policy from Cornell University School of Human Ecology. Dr. Ellis Williams is Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at New Jersey City University. She teaches courses on black womanhood, diversity, and difference, women's lives, women and leadership, women, hip hop, and social change, urban men of color, color race, class, gender, activism. Dr. Ellis Williams was invited to present a TEDx talk, Finding Justice in the Land of the Free, Art House Productions, Jersey City, June 2015. Some other recent presentations and papers include Black Women's Use of Spoken Word Tradition as Resistance, Virtual versus Live Expressions, University of San Antonio, Texas, April 2015. When the Booty is White, Race Identity, Appropriation and the lingering Sarah Bartman effect on young black women. Keynote speaker, King, King University. Comparative analysis of women in the African diaspora. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Reverend Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams. Good evening to the young brothers and sisters who have a few more days in school, to the ones who have graduated debt-free and know that legacy comes with a cost, to those who are still struggling to make it today, to the brothers who are standing outside in the rain making sure our cars are okay to those who have cleaned these carpets so we can walk on them and not think about them, to those who pay the light bill and those who have protected us when we have sat 
in our beds, for the grandmothers who have prayed when we didn't know what to do, for those who have stayed sober just one more day, for the immigrants who come here invisible and cook and clean and take care of your mess, to those who have a language that their tongue does not sound like the perfect English, to my two black sons born in Newark and blessed just like you, to my husband, Junius Williams, the noted historian of Newark, to my own immigrant community, to the shepherd of this church, to the first lady, for those who pray and those who get tired of praying, but still pray anyway, for those who desire to serve and are aching to do something and want to be called, someone is calling you right now. For those of you who have kept the faith, I greet you in that spirit. Good evening. I turned to my brother, Derek Green, and I said, well, the governor said everything, so I, you know, nothing else to say, but. So in that narrative that we heard about in June 19th, 1865, Go back a couple of years in August 1862 when Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, published an editorial address to Lincoln pressuring his stance on slavery and urging him to abolish it. The president at that time responded thusly, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save this union. Do not be fooled. Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. But we believe in the name of the Lord. Be careful of putting all your trust in those in high places because the record will show in the end they are going to make sure to protect the union. They're not going to dismantle the very system that put them in place. What do you think they are? Crazy? It's crazy to follow them if you don't understand the historical record. So in 1862, the president of the time said, I don't care if you incarcerated. I don't care if you locked in cages. I don't care if you locked up and locked out and you can't get an education. What I want to do is preserve the status quo. Lincoln and the Union Army used slavery as a political motive to justify strengthening military goals against the Confederacy. Black soldiers were recruited. Come on, black boys, come on and fight for this place. Come on, we're going to give you a uniform and we're gonna make you just like us. What they forgot to tell our black brothers is, is that we do not care about you. You shoot when we say shoot, and you probably can't shoot to protect yourself. You remember those who flew in the, remember those brothers who flew side by side in the war, red tails. The Civil War ended in April of 1865, General Gordon Grainer and his troops, as we heard, came to Texas under the order number three. And it stated, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. The historical record will show the Emancipation Proclamation did not free all slaves. It was never intended to do that. There is exceptional clauses that exclude particular states. So some who think that that freed all slaves, you are incorrect with the history. He freed those that would be beneficial to uplift the system. And so therefore, they were a little confused because now, in fact, you are free. 
free. Free. So this morning on social media, if you follow me, you know I like my social media. Thank you, my girls. This is my social media friend. And today the word is free-ish. 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 You're sitting here thinking you're free, but you're free-ish. Those who knew they had family up north, they went to Louisiana and Arkansas and Oklahoma in the short term, and we heard the governor tell us about eventually coming to New Jersey, which was the last northern state to end slavery. You gotta marinate on that a little bit. The last northern state in the United States to end slavery because it felt a little good up north. The down south, we are that place. Don't get a little cozy and comfy thinking that you are free. 1870, a group of former enslaved people raised $800. Pastors, you're gonna like this. They raised $800 through local churches to purchase 10 acres of land and create Emancipation Park to host future Juneteenth celebrations in modern Houston. How much land do we own? Even in 1870, they understood that in order to be free, they needed to have some wealth and to have their own land. The churches got together, raised money, and they bought acres of land for their people. What we got now? Free-ish. Free-ish. We got debt, but we ain't got no land. How far have we really come? The celebration of Juneteenth was coined and Juneteenth grew. The celebration was to reassure us every year and we had to come together to pray. That's part of what the tradition wanted us to do. Now here we go, some black folks have not heard that they are free, so they still begging scraps from the master's table. You guys worried that back then they didn't know they're free. Guess what, some of y'all don't still know you're free. <laughs> Rather than just stand your ground like everyone else knows to do, stand our ground, we will not be moved from the table. Some folks believe that freedom is the same as equal rights. We're happy with Martin Luther King holiday, it is sufficient. And yes, there are some who have confused because they think that Brother Obama, freedom. Some of you understand that Juneteenth is a day to remember that freedom is the goal. We have come far and I am so grateful to God Almighty for how far we have come. My parents came to the United States in the 60s without four of their children, left us there to seek a better place. I learned that I couldn't talk the way I did because when I moved into Orange, New Jersey, the people that looked just like me, they throw a wrong stone upon my head. They came to our house and they said, you all need to go back. So I learned that in order to move and to deal with, I gotta change my tongue. So I learned how to be very swaggy. I learned that, you know, pickle pepper work best for the people that like pickle pepper, but I also learned that you need to have some hot sauce in your bag. Uh-uh. Beehive, where are you? I rejoice in what God is doing, but freedom in America must be understood as equity, justice, restoration for all. That is what we're talking about. And, and as I get ready to take my seat, because I do believe in following the instructions, sir, I'm going to use Isaiah 61, verse 8 and 9. And it reads thusly, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will 
be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are the people of the Lord and be blessed. I pray our children and our children's children and the children of our children's children and seven generations ahead of us will feel that they have been truly loved from what we do today. Because only what you do for Jesus counts and only what you put forward today will grow. I pray for good seed. I pray that my children, my grandsons that I do not know, my great grandsons and the grandsons of others would know that we cared for this earth. I pray that our freedom will be free from mental slavery. We'll be free from cultural slavery. We'll be free from economic slavery and we'll be free to know that love is above everything. And I know that in the end, God will say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant, because I know that you have done your very best. You have thought about me, not just today, but you have considered the tomorrow. God says, I'll take care of tomorrow because he has blessed you today. Y'all could do better than that. Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams, Reverend Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams. Outstanding word, outstanding word. Before we leave, one second, uh, Bishop Lewis, don't, don't go nowhere, I'm trying to sneak out. Dr. Lewis, where is he? He leaving? Come on, come, come on back up here. We have in our, we have in our presence, the, the founder of the World Gospel Music Association, Dr. Albert Lewis, a legend here in New Jersey. This month is Gospel Music Heritage Month, and on June 29th in Trenton, there's going to be a major concert that Dr. Lewis is putting on at the War Memorial at 7 p.m. All are welcome to come. Dr. Lewis, we love you, and we just thank God for your presence here this evening. Our next speaker, all the faith leaders, please stand, first of all, all the faith leaders. For well, all the faith leaders, let's give them a round of applause. All the faith leaders that are here, amen. Amen. Our final speaker for this evening needs no introduction. Dr. Larry Hamm. He is, he has, I will say this, there are people who give their lives for the, for the movement, for the cause, for, for the struggle. He has given his entire life. I grew up listening to him and studying him. He is, still is the youngest appointed Board of Education member in the United States of America. You were 17? He was 17 years old, appointed by the Honorable Mayor Ken Gibson. He then founded, he's a graduate of Princeton. He founded the dynamic organization, People's Organization for Progress, POP. And everybody knows what they say, power to the people, power to the people. Larry Ham is one of the most humble men that I know. Powerful man, well respected. When he walks into a room, everybody listens because they know Larry has something important to say about social and economic justice. Larry, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. We know that you've come under attack, but God has sustained you and your voice and your spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, the founder of the People's Organization for Progress, Larry Ham.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. Brothers and sisters, I'm so glad to be here. First of all, giving honor to God and recognizing the great leader of this congregation, this church of the oranges, Reverend Stoddard and his first lady. Give them a hand. And recognizing this church and its congregation that it would open its doors so that we could have a Juneteenth celebration in here tonight. I just wish all the churches would open their doors and have a Juneteenth celebration all throughout the state of New Jersey. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I'm so glad that Reverend Green asked me to be on this program. He didn't have to do it. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't have to be here. I could be on the street corner demonstrating where I usually am. <laughs> but Reverend Green said, Larry, come on in this, this time. Tonight we want you to come in, and I'm glad that we had a governor that saw fit to come and honor the Juneteenth holiday here at the Churches of the Orange, because he didn't have to. I've lived long enough. I'm 65 years old. And tonight was the first night that I saw a governor of the state of New Jersey at a Juneteenth celebration. This is the truth. And I, before I say anything else, Reverend, let me thank God. Because I am a cancer survivor. I am a cancer survivor. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I want to say something to the black men in here tonight. Don't be silly. Don't be squeamish. Go and get the prostate exam because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. When I was diagnosed with cancer, the first thing they said, Mr. Ham, we're gonna to have to remove your prostate gland. And I went home and prayed on it because I have friends who did not go and have the prostate examination and had to have their prostate removed and their quality of life suffered mightily. I prayed on it and I went back to the doctor and the doctor said, Mr. Ham, we did some tests. We're not going to have to remove your prostate gland. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> then they said, Mr. Ham, we're going to have to give you radiation treatment. We're going to have to give you 55, 55 treatments three days a week every week until you're done and i went home and prayed some more <laughs> and i came back and the doctor said good news mr ham we're not gonna have to give you 55 we only on to have to give you five five treatments And I had my follow-up treatment, and I'm free and clear of the cancer. I'm so glad. So glad to be here with you tonight. Because one of the great disparities, and I'm so glad the governor went through all the inequalities that we have to endure as a people, because one of the great disparities that black people endure 
is the disparity in the length of our lives. Because health care is not accessible to all of us. But I'm so glad that I had the good sense to listen to those who said, go and get the exam. See, we, so let me speak honestly. We squeamish because it's a digital exam. And I'm not talking about computers now. I'm talking about the fingertips. It's a digital exam. And some of us, you know, we are, you know, manly men. And we don't want to be digitally exam. But I bet you if you had your prostate removed and you knew what you had to go through, you'd think that was nothing. Don't be silly. Go and get your examination tomorrow. So much has been said, and I don't want to be redundant. But this is Juneteenth. It's a holiday of the African-American people. Those of us who are the descendants of those who were enslaved here in these United States, in the continental United States for 245 years of chattel slavery. If we count from the time that slavery began in the Western Hemisphere, it began on October 12, 1492, the day that our children have been taught to celebrate is the day that slavery began because on his first voyage, not his second and his third, Columbus took slaves. In fact, Columbus treated his own slaves on his plantation so poorly that he was arrested by the king and queen of Spain and put in jail. Columbus Day for Africans and Native American indigenous people should be a day of mourning and not a day of celebration. And if we count, brothers and sisters, from the advent of Columbus' arrival in the Caribbean, it's nearly 500 years of slavery in the Western Hemisphere. No one has had to endure what we endured for those centuries. I tell you, as I stand here, I'm proud to say that I'm a descendant of those Africans that were enslaved here in America and in the Western Hemisphere. I am proud to be a black person in the 21st century here in the United States. People talk about make America great again. How did America get great? Our people made it great. This country is great because it stands on 400 years of stolen labor here in the United States. 400 years. They stole us. They sold us, and they owe us. Isn't it a paradox that on this Juneteenth, that as we celebrated here tonight, that in the halls of the Congress of the House of Representatives of the United States of America, the Judiciary Committee was taking testimony on H.R. 40, the reparations bill. Yes, black people deserve reparations for the stolen labor of our land ancestors. What else could I say to you? If I say anything less than that, I betray you, I betray my ancestors, I betray our people. Don't walk around here talking about, don't nobody owe you nothing. They owe you everything. They owe you everything. If they could give reparations to indigenous people, if they could give reparations to Japanese for their internment 
in concentration camps, if they can give reparations to Jewish people that had to work in slave labor camps in Europe, they certainly can give reparations to their black people here in the United States of America. If I were to say less, then my tongue should cleave to the roof of my mouth, and I should lose the strength of my arm. That if I should say less than the truth, if I should sugarcoat what happened to us, the years of murder, the years of abuse, the years of torture, the years of whippings, the years of the rapes of our mothers and our grandmothers. If I said less than the truth, then I would be a treason and I would be a betrayer to you. Yes, this is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of enslaved Africans. August 23rd, 1619, a Dutch frigate sails out of the Caribbean, up the East Coast to Point Comfort. You say Jamestown, but they actually arrived at Point Comfort. And the initial Africans that came here, initially they didn't come as enslaved people. They came as indentured servants because in the very beginning when this country needed labor, indentured servitude was the mechanism by which to force that labor. And it took some 60 years for enslavement to become coterminous with being African. Listen, they literally passed laws that said if you were born of an African mother, you would be enslaved, and these are the words of the colonial law, you would be enslaved in perpetuity. Do you know what in perpetuity means? It meant that the people that wrote those laws had an idea that we would be their slaves forever. But thank God, we had some people who didn't care what the odds were, who didn't care if the master had the power, if he had the men, if he had the horses, if he had the guns, if he had the whips, if he had the chains. They knew they were children of God and should not be in bondage. What, what is the price of freedom? How can you read that Bible and not know? How can you tell the Moses story and not know? How can you tell the story of Joseph who sold his own brothers into slavery and not know their story is our story and our story is their story? Our people fought against the odds. Herbert Aptecker wrote a book called Slave Rebellion in Colonial America. There were 400 recorded slave rebellions. We never accepted it. Never. We didn't accept it in Africa. In Africa, there was a black queen named Nzinga. She wasn't strutting around in front of the mirror. She had her bow and arrow in one hand and her spear in the other, and she was fighting the slave masters. Sinke was on the Amistad, and they overthrew the ship's captain. And when they got here to the United States, their story was so true and so great, they got their freedom and were sent back home. We can't talk about Abraham Lincoln and not talk about Denmark Vesey. We can't talk about Abraham Lincoln and not talk about Nat Turner. We can't talk about Nat Turner 
and Denmark, BC, and not talk about Harriet Tubman, our people who fought against the enslavement. And the irony is, is that every step of the way we were there, they teach our children about the American Revolution. They teach them about Paul Revere. And they teach them about George Washington. But they don't teach them about the 5,000 black troops that fought in the American Continental Army. Do you know that right here in New Jersey, I mean, don't talk about slavery like you talking about some far away. I ain't just talking about North Carolina. I ain't just talking about South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia. I'm talking about right here. Slavery was right here in New Jersey, brothers and sisters. Tell me when my time is up. I don't want to be a poor guest. But I'm going to tell you something. This was a Dutch colony founded in 1620. And by 1624, African enslaved people were here clearing the land, building dams, building bridges, building roads, laying the foundation of civilization here in New Jersey. But our children don't learn about that. You know why they don't learn about that? Because you don't demand that they learn about that. We should demand the full implementation of the Amistad Black Studies Act that was passed by the state legislature of New Jersey, which says black studies is to be infused into every social studies course, not just a black studies course over here that nobody don't have to take. It's got to be in every social studies course. How many of you been down to the New Jersey PAC? Do you know that the New Jersey PAC sits on an African burial ground? Do you know it was the People's Organization for Progress, Nello, am I telling the truth? The People's Organization for Progress that stopped the construction of the New Jersey PAC because when they were digging it up, they found bodies and we said we want to know who that is those were African and Native American by It sits on an African cemetery. And if you go out on the plaza of the New Jersey PAC, you will see an arch with a glass in the middle that has the names of many of those enslaved African people that were buried there, that were buried there. And one of those names was Jack Cujo. And Jack Cujo was an African slave who fought so well in the American Revolution that George Washington gave him his freedom and his land. And you know where the land is? Where the Star Ledger building was on Washington and University. That's where Jack Cujo's farm was. You don't know this history. Your children don't know. We must demand black studies in all schools in New Jersey. What is the price of freedom? Do you know where I was on Memorial Day? This past Memorial Day, I got up out my bed and I said, there's somewhere, Reverend Green, I got to go. I went down to the African Cemetery. No, not the one in Newark. There's an African cemetery in a town called Pennington, New Jersey, a little town between Trenton and Princeton. The black people there in 1863 bought land. You know why, Antoinette, they bought that land? Because even though there was a Union army fighting against slavery, the black soldiers, and I'm talking about the black Union soldiers, and the white Union soldiers could not be buried in the same cemetery, not even here in New Jersey, Reverend. And the black people of Pennington put their pennies together and said, we're going to bury our soldiers honorably. We're going to have a place for them to lay honorably. And they named it, listen, they didn't name it the Colored Cemetery. 
than Negro Cemetery. They named it the African Cemetery because we are an African people and we must never forget that. And I went to Pennington. On the way down, I stopped at the 7-Eleven and got some of them $12 roses. <laughs> and I went into the cemetery and I put one rose on each grave. And let me tell you something. When you look, and I wanted to say this to the governor before he leaves, so you say it for me. When you look at the headstones, it don't just have the men's names and the year that they were born and the year that they died. It has their regiment. It has COL, which meant colored troops. It had infantry. It had cannon master. It had cavalry. You know why all of that was on their headstone? Because they wanted you, black people, to know down through the ages what their contribution was for your freedom. You walking around here today all puffed up with pride like you have what you had, like you got it all by yourself. But everything we have, every benefit we have, we got it because somebody sacrificed for it, paid for it with lives, paid for it with blood, paid for it with treasure. I need to sit down, but let me say this real quick. Before I sit down, don't make light of the Civil War. If there had not been a Civil War, we might not be free today. Remember, Brazil did not end slavery until almost the 20th century. For hundreds of years, people prayed for an end to slavery. They petitioned for an end to slavery. They wrote letters to the governor and the king and people in power for an end to slavery. But finally, it took a war. It took a catastrophic war. Listen to this. More Americans died in the Civil War than in World Wars I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam combined. Nearly one million Americans died in the Civil War. The war was so catastrophic that religious groups actually thought the Civil War was the war of the apocalypse, Mildred. They thought it was the end of the world. They had never seen fighting like this. Soldiers would write home and say, Mama, I'm standing waist deep in rivers of blood, in battles like Antietam and Gettysburg. 25,000, 30,000 fell in a day, and they didn't even have automatic weapons. And the North wasn't winning the war because they didn't have resolve. McClellan, who was from New Jersey, was the supreme commander of the Union forces. He wouldn't fight. He had a 1,000 men camped out on the Potomac, and Lincoln was sending him telegraph. Why are, when are you going to fight? And finally, he hired, he fired McClellan, and he hired Ulysses S. Grant. And yes, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And yes, it was a military recruitment document, but it is one of the most important documents to understand the process of emancipation. You know, when I was coming up in South 17th Street School, we had to recite the Constitution. We had to recite the, the Declaration of Independence. I want to know what school in Orange, what school in East Orange, what school in my town, Montclair, requires the students to recite from memory the Emancipation Proclamation. I challenge this church to give a scholarship to the young person that can stand and deliver the Emancipation Proclamation verbatim. And Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation and black men respond. 220,000 black men respond. 186,000 join the army and the rest join the other branches of service. And even during that racist period, 36 
received congressional medals of honor for their valor. Lincoln wouldn't have won the Civil War if it hadn't been for those black soldiers that enlisted and joined in the Union Army. But I got something to say to you. If you know that this is true, then where is the honor for these men? Where are the celebrations? In every town, there are graves of Civil War soldiers. Don't you know Memorial Day comes out of the black struggle? Memorial Day was Decorations Day. It started as a, as a memorial to a mass grave for over 100 soldiers that were killed by the Confederacy. And then the Army took it over and made it Memorial Day. On Memorial Day, black people should be taking school classes, should be taking Sunday school classes, should be taking churches, should be taking lodges and, and fraternal organizations and going and putting. Well, our children don't even know what a real superhero is. They know about Hulk, they know about Iron Man, but the real Iron Man were the ones that liberated us in 1865. My father fought, my grandfather fought against the Nazis, against the Germans in World War I. His name is Claude Cobb. My grandfather and my father are buried in the veterans section of the Glendale Cemetery, literally rows apart. My grandfather was from Georgia. And you know, I didn't grow up an activist or a militant. I didn't even know I was black till I was probably 10 or 11 years old. When the, when the, when the rebellion erupted, and I'm gonna sit down in a minute, when the rebellion erupted in Newark, my family didn't belong to the NACP. They didn't talk about race all the time. But when the riot broke out, the rebellion, as we say, I said, Papa, because my father died when I was four. My grandfather was my father. I said, Papa, why are people so mad? He said, Bootsy, because that's what they called me when I was a kid, because I like cowboy boots. <laughs> he said, Bootsy, when I was in the army and we got to France and we got off the boat, and we went into the town. The French people asked to see my tail. That was in World War I. My father fought the Nazis. In World War II, my father was in the Europe. Lawrence Ham, that's his name. Imagine looking at a tombstone and seeing your name on it. He fought against the Germans in World War II. But do you know that black people came home from those wars in their uniforms. They were lynched. They were dragged through the streets. They were killed by the Klan and other racist organizations. Why don't we remember these men? We always talk about what black men don't do. Those men did something, and we need to talk about it. So let me wind up with this, brothers and sisters. I wish I could talk to you all night long. Maybe someday somebody will invite me and I can just pour out everything I know on you. Because I want to breathe into your nostrils. I want to breathe into your nostrils the spirit of freedom. I want to breathe into your nostrils the spirit of rebellion. I want you to be able to take a breath like Nat Turner took a breath. I want you to be able to breathe it out like Denmark Vesey breathed it out. I want you to be able to feel the strength that Toussaint felt when he fought against the French, defeating the superpower of his day. I want you to feel the strength, the power that we have as a people. We are a great people. We have overcome all kinds of obstacles. And we got some challenges today. But I tell you, those challenges pale in comparison to what our ancestors went through. We got to unite as a people, put aside all these differences, 
you from here and I'm from there. The only difference was the slave ship dropped you off in Haiti and dropped us off in Carolina. That's the only difference. We're one people, one blood, with one destiny. We've overcome all kinds of obstacles and we will overcome this. So I tell you, teach your children unity. Teach them to love one another, but teach them to love themselves. Why are we walking around here buying skin bleaching cream? Why are we walking around here getting plastic surgery? God, we are made in the image of God. Where's nothing, nothing, nothing for us to be ashamed of. So I end with this. On Saturday, we're going to march for reparations. Here in Newark, New Jersey, Saturday at 12 o'clock, we're going to meet at the Lincoln Monument, the one in front of the courthouse, at the intersection of West Market Street and Springfield Avenue. March for reparations. Don't be ashamed to say they owe us, because they do owe us. If they didn't owe us, they wouldn't be talking about it in Congress. I'm telling you. But let's unite, brothers and sisters. Let's register in record numbers because we're not going to make any progress as long as we have that racist, bigoted, xenophobic, hateful person in the White House. We need to have massive voter registration and come out in massive numbers and 20 and sweep all of those oppressors out of office. Power to the people. Closing out the Juneteenth celebration here at the Church of the Oranges, Seventh-day Adventist Church. A beautiful ceremony we heard from the governor who brought words of wisdom and showed an outline of his agenda to make sure that we as a people advance together and not separately. And then there were the speakers that came through who gave us a little bit of a history about Juneteenth and what we can do to make sure that Juneteenth is not just a celebrated day, but it's something that we put into action. That's really our message for the community, to take our celebration and put into action getting the word out. Juneteenth, as you know, in uh, 1863, when we were freed, it took two years to get the message out. And they landed in Texas and people labored uh, nearly 42 months not knowing that they were free. But still today, even with the internet, even with all the access that we have, we don't know how free we really are. So get that message out, get it into action, and make sure we celebrate Juneteenth in a real way. Here at Juneteenth, June 19th, 2019, City of Orange Township, Seventh-day Adventist Church, Church of the Oranges. We thank that congregation, and we thank all who came to put this together.